I'm mean, so happy you, you uprooted yourselves to join this march. We do not want to make this an arrestable event. We want to be here to help clean and heal this beautiful, tormented planet of ours. Let's get out. We acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded stolen land of the Abenaki people on which we are participating today. Abenaki people have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. We honor their community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We recognize that colonialism and the oppression of Native peoples is an ongoing process and we commit to building our awareness of our present participation. This acknowledgement demonstrates our intention to begin working to dismantle the legacy of settler colonialism here in Vermont. I bring a message yeah, so. Thank you. from the trees. For a while. The first people of this land know us, have always known us. We speak to them as we speak to the birds, the streams, the wind. We offer habitat to the birds who sing to you. We feed you nuts and fruits and sap. Some of you are just now realizing our intelligence, how we communicate and form community. Pay attention. Many of you here today understand how important we are in the struggle to save our environment. Spread that word. Sometimes we bring messages from ancestors. Listen deeply. We ask you to protect us. Thank you. I did want to start out also acknowledging the Abenaki people's land, unceded territories that we're standing on, and to contemplate for a moment the history, the sad history, and imagine the different path that might have been taken on this land, the Dawn land, had it not been colonized and brutally the way it has been. And the way that we've treated the indigenous people in the United States is very much like we've treated our forests. The way we treat the forests reflects the way we have treated each other and the rest of the planet. And it's a sad thing to comprehend. It's a sad thing to comp contemplate. And it's beautiful to see a bunch of people out here saying, you know what? 
It's time for change. It's time for change. The, col the colonization of this country was based on cutting down trees to a very large extent. The early explorers came here and they said, ooh, delectable, beautiful forests, lots of wood. We can cut it down. We can ship it overseas. We can take it elsewhere. We can make military ships out of the trees. There were 250, 300 foot tall white pines all through these woods. And they saw those and thought, masts for our military ships. And they labeled them, you can't take these ones because these ones are especially good for making the ships that we're going to use to expand our empire. That was then and now, something like 99% of the frontier forests, the frontier forest being big expanse is a forest with all the native species intact and all the species that belong here that live in those forests. 99% of that in this country is now gone since we first landed here. In fact, there's only something like 15% of the forests in the U.S. that are older than 100 years. Contemplate that. Only 15% of the forest is older than 100 years. We have tree species that live hundreds and hundreds of years, and they're all just little babies. They're struggling to grow up, and we just keep cutting them down. As soon as they get big enough, and they're big enough to make some wood out of, we go and cut them out, we go and cut them down again. And then little babies struggle to try to grow. And we have so few old trees left. There's almost no old growth forest in the state of Vermont. Almost none left. Most of us don't even know what old growth forest looks like. We, we have learned a lot about forests in the, in the recent years. We've learned about the forest ecology. We've come to understand there's such a thing as mother trees and that forests are, are integrated systems with mother trees. They communicate through the soils and through the air and they are entirely integrated systems. And they understand that their survival depends on the survival of the rest of the trees in the forest. And that's a lesson that we need to learn from the trees and from the forest is that our survival depends on one another, how we treat one another, and on how we treat the world and how we treat the forest around us. It's interdependence. We cannot just live in isolation from the rest of the living world. Nor can a, an old tree live in a forest without the rest of the community of trees around it. We've also learned that trees recycle. They are responsible for our water. We will not have water without them. Thanks, because I'm going to get a sore throat yelling. Yeah. <laughs> Two thirds of the fresh water in the United States is filtered through forests. That's through transpiration and rainfall, absorbed, set off into the sky, condensing, falling back down as rain, and, and regenerating all of our fresh water that we depend on. By some estimates, the vegetation on land cycles 48 cubic miles of water a day. The role of forests in controlling rainfall is on a global scale. So I read recently that Deforestation in the Congo Basin is responsible for decrease in rainfall in the Ethiopian highlands, which is the headwaters of the Nile River, which is the water source for 300 million people on this planet. The same is true with the Amazon in, in, uh, in South America. The Amazon Basin transpires so much water into the interior of Central and South America and up into the interior of the United States. So one has to wonder the droughts that we're experiencing in parts of the western United States aren't ultimately related to the deforestation that's happening in the Amazon. So what happens in one place does not stay there. It has impacts all over the globe because just as a forest is an integral system, so is the rain and the hydrology of our planet. Recent studies have shown too that healthy forests emit volatile compounds into the air and those help to seed rain droplets. They also help to clean pollution out of the air. And scientists who are studying this are finding that there are places where these volatile compounds are absent from the atmosphere anymore because of deforestation. And that's impacting our air quality.
So we've learned a lot about forests, and one of the important things we've learned is about the role of carbons in climate change and understanding that trees can store carbon. And there's a lot of discussion about the role of forests in, in climate change. And in the, in the UN discussions about climate, this has been going on forever. Let's let you know this polluter over here continue to pollute, but we'll plant some trees over there to store an equivalent amount of carbon. Or let's cut down trees, turn them into pellets, ship them across the Atlantic Ocean and burn them in a biomass power station instead of coal, and then give the power station lots and lots of money because we're going to call that renewable energy and pretend that it's carbon neutral and that some new trees, trees will grow and offset all of the carbon that's emitted when we do that. But in fact, about 50 to 150 percent more carbon is emitted from burning wood than is burned from coal per unit of energy that you generate. And the air pollution that you get is comparable to what you get when you burn coal. More particulates, actually, less of some other things. So we're subsidizing burning trees for electric power uh, and calling it renewable energy. And we need to get that biomass out of any definition of renewable energy because we need more trees, not less trees. Now there's talk. Yeah, now there's talk of using trees for just about everything. And I went to a presentation not too long ago. It was a Weyerhaeuser uh, executive. And this first slide they put up said, was a picture of forest, you know, pretty trees, and a little bubble above it saying, what can a tree be? And then they went on to talk about how you can make plastics out of trees and you can make uh, alternatives for concrete and steel out of trees. You can engineer trees to secrete industrial chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's a strange view of our forests. I was just really shocked. I thought, what would aliens think if they came down to this planet, you know? And they saw these amazing things that grow up out of the ground and they are able to hold themselves up to the sky and uh, and, and do this magic that they do with the sunlight and water. I mean, imagine that you'd never seen a tree before. You'd be so awestruck. And here, these creatures crawling around on this planet are intent on just getting rid of these things without even realizing the oxygen they breathe, the water they drink is completely dependent on it. Treating forests as an unlimited, renewable, extractable commodity that can support infinite growth in the forest products industry is an outdated business model. That's a quote from Dana Smith from Dogwood Alliance, who is going to be here uh, giving us a presentation on the 13th of May, so watch for that. This idea that we can just keep cutting down our forests is incompatible with life. It is incompatible with the idea that has been put forward about proforestation as a way to address the climate crisis. If we let forests grow, the old trees, the new trees will store carbon, they will bring carbon out of the atmosphere. And it's one of the only tried and true remedies that we have for getting some of the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere back out of the atmosphere. And we need desperately to be doing that. Unfortunately, that understanding about the role of forests, both in terms of just supporting our life, but also in terms of how, we, how it can address the climate crisis, uh, has been ignored by a lot of the agencies in charge of deciding forest policy. Uh, they have not got up to date with the science, which is now, you know, decade old or more, about the role of forests in science. And so they are continuing to advocate for using wood, uh, using more, basically creating more market demand for wood. And the forest product industry is very good at obfuscating and using terminology that makes it sound like they're going to, you know, create new habitat, or we're going to do a, they're going to give the forest a treatment, like it's a spa day for the forest with a chainsaw in hand, uh, you know, treatment, yeah. Um, so they're very good at obfuscating, and they take advantage of the fact that many people don't know what a real forest looks like anymore because they live in cities, or they live in places where the forests are so degraded that they can't tell the difference anymore. And the forest product industry capitalizes on that at every turn. And now in Vermont, we are faced with the U.S. Forest Service plans to escalate logging dramatically. At the turn of the century, you know, Vermont was, Vermont was basically clear cut for farming when the first settlers arrived here. And since then, 
uh, the forests in, in many places in Vermont have been trying to recuperate. And of course, people keep going in and re-logging, then re-logging as soon as the tree gets a little bit big. But you know, when you walk out into the forest, you see all these trees and they're only this, their trunks are only the size of my arm or two. They're still little baby trees. They're not those 300 foot towering white pines. You don't see them anywhere. So, but the, the Forest Service sees this as recovered forest and it's merchantable timber and let's go in there and do some logging or treatment or habitat creation, whatever term they decide they're going to use for it. And there are 43,000 acres of land currently permitted for logging in the state of Vermont. And when we found out about that, a lot of people in Vermont said, what? What? We need more forests, not less forests. Why would they be going in and cutting our our uh, precious forests at this point, given what we know about the important role of forests. And you know, we're, we, uh, we have started to come together, and I think this event is one uh, illustration of that. We've got a, a newly uh, minted little group of people that is calling itself Standing Trees Vermont, and our mission is to protect and restore forests and public lands. We're not looking at private lands, we're just looking at public lands in the state of Vermont. Green Mountain National Forest, 43,000 acres of, of land that's targeted for logging. We want to say no, no, don't, don't do that, don't go there. The state forests, we want to say no, don't go there. Because the forests that are on our public lands belong to us. And we feel that the highest good for the public who owns those forests is to, would be met by letting them continue to grow. And yeah, there are, we have to remember those are our forests. We pay for those forests. We own those forests, if you will. Um, of course, the forests own themselves. But you know, the bottom line is we have a say over what the future of these forests is. And so that's a, that's a place where we can start. Um, so watch for Standing Trees Vermont. Protecting our forests is a climate justice issue. Martin Luther King said, for in the true nature of things, if we rightly consider every green tree is far more glorious than if it were made of gold and silver. When we destroy the forests, it impacts everyone. It impacts people on the other side of the planet. It impacts our water, it impacts our air, it impacts our health. Protecting our forests is something that we need to do for everybody. It's the the highest good that our, our forests can serve. Let's make our voices heard for the trees, for the birches, for the pines, for the larches, for the firs, the cedars, for the young trees, the old trees, the spruces, the maples, the sugar maples, yum yum, the red maples, all of you, all of us deserve that. Thank you.